about now, we're going to talk, Tony, we're going to talk to us about the Bible manuscripts. It's very interesting. Okay. Right. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So last time we talked about uh, the authorship. We, had, we, we talked about a, a lot of things, but mainly um, yesterday we were talking about the, the authorship uh, and how we can know whether or not whoever... We, whether or not we not, you know, the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We talked about Revelation. We talked about the Epistle, Pauline Epistles. And I encourage, you know, for anybody who wants to recap, you can go back and, and watch that, that lecture. Um, today, uh, today, we're going to be talking about the biblical manuscripts. So before we can actually discuss the actual reliability of the content found in the Bible, um, we first need to consider if the text we currently have today has not been corrupted or altered from when it was first written. And the process of analyzing the Bible in order to reproduce its original content is a field that many scholars dedicated their lives to studying and is referred to as textual criticism. This is also known as uh, lower criticism. We'll talk about what higher criticism is, but the lower criticism is uh, the textual criticism, which is the method that seeks not in interpreting the meaning of the Bible, but seeking the original words of the biblical text. And a lot of that is done by, well, we'll get into that, but uh, that, that's going to be the topic of today, right? How can we, how can we know what was, what we have now is what was originally written. All right, so a lot of the first questions that we have as well, um, you know, considering the manuscript copies, right? We have a lot of copies. Do we, do we have any originals though? That's the kind of question. So as of today, we do not have the original copies, okay? And there, there could be several reasons for that, right? And we'll, we'll go over those reasons, okay? So um, the very first one, which is, you know, the original copies were written on papyrus, okay? So papyrus is not something that is a very durable material, right? These were the earliest drafts were written on, on papyri. It wasn't until we had parchment, right? And parchment was used for codices. So codex is like a book style format. Uh, everything up until then was like in a scroll. So it was like in a manuscript scroll that was written on papyri. The parchments didn't come until much later, okay? Um, and most ancient documents, by the way, that were that old did not survive. So it's nothing unique to the New Testament in particular, okay? Uh, so that's the first thing, right? The materials themselves were very perishable. The second thing, you know, persecution was really uh, heavy upon the church and came in many different ways. And as I mentioned, we had a church historian by the name of Eusebius. He's a fourth century church historian uh, who recorded that many of the scriptures were actually burned during the time of Diocletian's persecution. Uh, he says this quote, he says, all this persecution has been fulfilled in our day when we saw with our own eyes our houses of worship thrown down from their elevation, the sacred scriptures of inspiration committed to flames in the midst of the markets, right? So the church has gone through a lot of persecution, a lot of people who try to kind of um, harm the church and destroy her writings, right? However, there's no reason to assume that the originals were just copied once, uh, only once and forgotten. It is very reasonable to suggest that were actually copied many times and in fact, there were there are several um, reasons why we believe this, because Tertullian, who is a uh, second to third century uh, father, he said he said this. He says in regards to the original copies that were present in his day, he said that the following. He says, "Come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity, if you would apply it to the business of your salvation." run over to the apostolic churches in which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent in their places, in which their own authentic writings are read, right? So he, he mentions that, that the authentic writings over there are, are currently being read. And this, he was during the time between 155 to 240 AD. 
shortly after him in 311 AD, we have Pope Peter of Alexandria, right? And he, he says something similar. He says, the copy itself that was written by the hand of the evangelist, by which by the divine grace has been preserved in the most holy church of Ephesus and is there adorned by the faithful, right? So obviously he's, he's talking about the letter to the Ephesians and he's mentioning that th that letter was still alive in his day. And that's the fourth century, the early fourth century, okay? Um, a third reason, and this is more of a speculation, is that, you know, we could be tempted to think that the original copies, um, th we think more of them than we should in the sense that we might be tempted into turning them into objects of worship, right? Uh, of course, they should be revered. Of course, they are sacred. And, but but it's, um, it's easy for people to, to uh, turn that which is, which is venerable into something a little bit more. And, and in which case, God obviously would, would prefer the focus and worship be on him than any material object that we have. Of course, we, re we revere these things, but um, we obviously don't want to set them as the, as the goal or the, the main goal of a worship, right? Okay, so this is in regards to the original copies, right? And, and the rationale for um, why as of, as of now, at least we, have, we don't have them, okay? But I do want to talk about, you know, what do we have, right? Because that's very important. That's, that's how we're able to arrive at uh, the, the actual wording of the text itself, right? As of the ancient copies, we have about 5,000, almost 700 handwritten Greek New Testament manuscripts. Um, in addition, we also have 10,000 Latin translations, and we have about almost... Uh, 9,200 other translations, whether it be in Old Latin, Coptic, uh, the Ethiopian language, the Slavic, Georgian, and so on and so forth, right? And so it brings us close to about 25,000 manuscript copies of uh, the New Testament that we have today. Now, keep in mind that this number here, the 5,700, is actually, the, these are the most ancient, right? Because the original language of the New Testament was written in Greek, okay? So, and I'll talk about, you know, our earliest copies and, and what they consist of, right? Um, I actually have two slides of it. The earliest manuscript that we have is, a, as you can see on the upper right-hand corner, this is the John Ryland fragment. I'll talk about what is actually written on it, but um, for now, I just want to give you guys these quick highlights, right? This is the John Ryland fragment. This is from the Gospel of John, Okay. The very next thing, and it goes by the name of P52, right? I think P standing for papyrus 52, I think is the, the 52nd papyrus that they, dis, that they have discovered. But this is the earliest one that they were able to date. Um, we have uh, the next one, the MSS, the P90, which contains the fragments of John, and that's that picture right there. We have the Magdalene papyrus, okay? That's fragments of Matthew's. The, the Bodmer papyrus, and this is where you start to see larger portions of the text, right? With around the 200s, uh, large books such as John, Jude, and First Peter. Um, and that's the, this is the Chester Betty papyri, which has a lot big portions of the Old and New Testament. Um, the Codex Vaticanus, which is the very first almost complete Bible the Sinaiticus, um, and then the Alexandrinus. So to give you a better picture of this, I have this chart, right? This is the John Ryland one, that's the very top, which shows uh, the passages, the date, um, and I can't really see it here because it's blocking me, but the, the, the time gap between the time it was actually written and, and the actual manuscript copy that we have. So this is the John Ryland, that one is the P90. I can't pronounce that word. Uh, this is 104. This is uh, P98. This is the Chester Betty. This is the Bodmer, and that's the Magdalene Papyrus, right? So just, you know, take a good look at this. Um, these are our earliest copies, right? As early as 29 year gap up until um, about 100, 150 years max or so. And, uh, you know, there's, there's not precise dating, you know, there is, there is a range here. So I just want to show you guys that. Um, so 
And if you have any questions, please let me know. So th these are the earliest copies. Now, how, how many, now let's gather all this information and let's look at it in this chart, right? This is in comparison with all other ancient works, um, pretty much everything of antiquity, right? So look at the staggering number of copies we have here for the New Testament. And not only that, but look at the gap in years. Now compare this to the gap in years between all the other texts. The earliest being 750 years with seven copies, right? So this, this is kind of blows everything out of the water. Um, but why is that so special? Why is that a big deal? Well, the larger the amount of early manuscripts, the better it is for scholars to accurately reconstruct the text. And they do this by cross-examining the copies from one another. Right. If we only had one copy, we had nothing to compare it to. It would be a disaster if, say, you know, that was a heretical copy. Right. So just to give you an example. Right. If I was giving a lecture and I was asking those who attended to transcribe the words that I said from memory. And let's say I asked them a week later. Right. It's probably not going to be very easy, especially if it was a week ago. Um, but if I ask everyone who is currently attending to transcribe my words, or maybe even paraphrase as I'm giving the talk right now, you may find that there are mistakes and errors if you look at everybody's copy, uh, but you can come to a, a logical, you know, a, a pretty good strong estimate of what it is that I said by cross-examining each of the copies. And you probably be able to accurately reproduce um, the words from my talk, especially if I'm asking many people, right? If I'm asking 5,608 people versus seven people, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult with the seven people, right? Um, and that's what uh, one uh, eminent scholar and translator of the Bible, uh, Bruce Metzger, who is an expert in textual criticism, you know, he says the more often you have copies that agree with each other, especially if they emerge from different geographical areas, the more you can cross check them to figure out what the original was like, right? Um, and this tells us something. This tells us a few things. The first thing is that the manuscripts of the New Testament are more reliable than any other document found in antiquity. That's the first thing. The second thing is people felt a stronger need to preserve its writings, which gives us insight into its value and impact on society. Okay. The amount of copies attest to the fact that it was considered as an invaluable document that was in such a high demand especially if we were to consider the persecution that the church was under and the fact that many of their documents and writings were burned and destroyed. I mean, you could only imagine what the total numbers of copies were if those copies weren't burned, right? So that, that this is kind of uh, very, very, very in interesting. Okay. For those of you interested about the Old Testament, I did show this graphic. Um, a lot of my sources are in the footnotes, so you can't see them, but if you want I could, I could let you know, just mark down the slide and, and uh, we can chat after. But if you look at the Old Testament, there's about 42,000 copies, right? So if you, that brings you a total number of 66,362. So there's, there's a ton of information that we have on this in comparison with, with everything else in antiquity. So we have many copies and we have a very close range in date between when they were originally written to, to right now. Um, right now, we're going to go into the reliability now of, you know, the, the actual text, because there is a lot of say regarding their variances. A lot of people have varying opinions on this, and it's important that we, we take a look at them. Uh, total copies, I think, including the Old Testament, I think I mentioned was 66,000. But as far as the New Testament goes, about 25,000, with the earliest being about 5,700. Okay, so um, I think it's important to bring up this guy on the left here, Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar who has written and edited 30 books, including three college textbooks. Okay, he has authored six New York Times bestsellers and considered to be one of the best New Testament scholars in the field of textual criticism and has received many accolades. Okay, this guy has written a lot and he studied a lot. So I'm going to share this quote from you by him okay he says i did my very best 
to hold on to my faith, that the Bible was the inspired word of God with no mistakes. He says this, I did my very best to hold on to my faith that the Bible was the inspired word of God with no mistakes, and that lasted for about two years. I realized that at the time we had over 5,000 manuscripts in the New Testament, and no two of them are exactly alike. The scribes were changing them, sometimes in big ways, but lots of times in little ways. And it finally occurred to me that if I really thought the God, that God had inspired this text, if he went to the trouble of inspiring the text, why didn't he go through the trouble of preserving the text? Why did he allow scribes to change it? Okay, so he remained a liberal Christian for 15 years, but later became agnostic, an agnostic, an agnostic atheist after struggling with a lot of these questions, okay? So this is a, a famous quote that he likes to say, right? Can somebody read that? We have something like 5,700 manuscripts of the New Testament. How many differences are there in our surviving New Testament manuscripts? Thousands of differences, tens of thousands of differences, hundreds of thousands of differences. It is probably easiest to put the matter in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Thank you. So this is a guy who, who's, you know, trying to, I guess, uh, shock you by, you know, by making these statements, right? Um, so there, there are many variances, he says. It's more than actual words in the New Testament. That's kind of shocking, right? Uh, that might really catch some people off guard. But there, there are three things we need to ask ourselves, right? The, very, the three things we need to ask ourselves is, what is exactly the number of variants, right? First of all, how many are there? How many changes are there between the different copies, okay? Once we understand that, the very next question should be, what is the nature of these variants? What kind of variations are there, right? What are we talking here? What are the kinds of differences is he, is he talking about? And then the last but most important question, what theological issues are at stake? Is the teaching the same? Is the content the same, right? So I, I, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna look into each one of these questions and see what the answer is, okay? So starting with, you know, what are the number of variants and then the, the type of variants and what theological issues are at stake, okay? I think it's important that we, we know this. So he, he likes to say something about the copies and the differences. He says, the, the handwritten copies of the New Testament contain a lot of differences. The best estimate is somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 variants, okay? Uh, this, this, as Urban is fond of saying, is actually more variants than there are words. There are about 184,000 words in the New Testament. I think it's very important to distinguish error in meaning from error in copying. Sometimes these two can overlap, but not necessarily. And I'll clarify what I mean by that. So that's why I prefer to use the term variant. Okay, let's take a look at the different variants and what kind of variants we're dealing with. There could be, it could be divided into two groups, right? Unintentional variants and intentional. So what are the unintentional? The very first one is confusing similarly shaped letters. You know, within the Greek, um, you have similar letters, right? You have the alpha and the delta. They kind of look very similar, especially somebody's not really good in their penmanship. Uh, the, the yota and the, the tau, it could look like a pi. You know, a lot of these letters can, can be confused if you're not careful in your writing, right? So that's the first one, the very most obvious um, example. You have dictography, and this is something which is a mistaken repetition of a letter or a word, right? So I gave you an example here in the Masoretic text that says the Lord shall make heard, and in here it says the Lord shall make heard, make heard. So it's, it's a repetition, okay? You have the opposite, which is haplography, which is the inadvertent omission right? So here's an example. We'll leave your corpse and the corpses of the Philistine army. Here it says, I will leave the corpses of the Philistine army. So you, you might omit a word by mistake. Maybe your eyes look too far ahead and you, you skip a word, okay? 
um, confusing similar sounding letters. So I have a statement here. Sometimes scribes would write from dictation or would read the words aloud to themselves while copying. Uh, one ex excellent example of this confusion can be found in Romans 5.1, where the manuscript evidence is quite equally divided between echomen, we have, and echomen, let us have. Notice they sound exactly the same, but one has an omega, one has an omicron, right? So if somebody were to say the, the sentence out loud, um, they may, you know, write omega instead of omicron. In which case, it does change the meaning from we have to let us have, okay? Um, we have word substitution. So variants can also occur when the scribe is trying to retain a line in their memory and accidentally replace some words with close synonyms, right? Or maybe he paraphrased. And then you have transposition. And this is very common in Greek uh, because Greek is a very inflective language. So what would happen is the scribe would unwittingly reorder the string of words, right? Because Greek is complex in that it, it can be written in multiple different combinations. Um, so one scholar says that the word order is generally more a matter of emphasis than meaning. So one can write in Greek, J Jesus loves John, okay? And the words can stand in any order without affecting the basic meaning. Okay, unlike in English, where if I say man, dog bites man, right, but I, I can't say man bites dog, that, that means something completely different. In Greek, it's a, it's a whole different ballgame, right? The, the order doesn't matter as much, okay? Um, the last one is assimilation. So sometimes you would have multiple manuscripts and scribes would, uh, you know, they would, they would have notes in the margins based on, what does it say? Some manuscripts contain notes or glosses in the margins from earlier scribes. These notes sometimes found their way in the actual text. So, so sometimes, and I'll actually show you an example of an ancient manuscript that, that had a note in it, uh, which was kind of funny. Okay, so these are the unintentional variants, right? Nothing major here. So the intentional so it says the wording of a particular phrase or sentence was sometimes altered to reflect the wording of another similar but more familiar one. So that's like if you're quoting from the Old Testament, right? This was especially common with quotations that had a longer form in a different book or quotations from the Septuagint. That's the Greek Old Testament, by the way, that did not conform to the exact wording of the Septuagint. So it's, it's more of paraphrasing or, or, or kind of harmonizing from different uh, sources. Then you have conflation, okay? Conflation tended to happen more often in biblical manuscripts. A scribe would sometimes make his copy using more than one manuscript. Where the wording of the other is differed from each other, a scribe would sometimes conflate both readings into one. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it makes more sense to call this harmonization because he's trying to bring all the different copies into, uh, simulate them. Uh, and then you have grammatical adjustments, right? Because the ancient Greek evolved over time. And I'll, I'll give you an example, I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, but if one were to really examine dogmatically, there, there are no major, there are no differences really, okay? Um, here's an example. If you look at the left-hand side, this is the, the most ancient style of writing in Greek. It's called, it's all capital. And this style is called unseal, U-N-C-I-A-L, unseal, okay? These are large capital letters, capital Greek letters, and there are no spaces in between the words, right? Can you imagine writing English, like a whole sentence or paragraph with no spaces? It could be confusing, right? And there's no punctuation, by the way. There's no such thing as quotations, right? This was from the fourth up until the, actually no, from even before the fourth century, uh, but up until the eighth century. Then you have the right-hand side, which is called the minuscule, which started around the seventh century, which had um, lowercase letters and some minor punctuation, which made it easier to tell the difference when a sentence ended and also separation between words. 
right? Um, so again, language evolves over time, right? Logically speaking, if language evolves over time, then, you know, obviously the Bible is composed over two millennia. It's entirely understandable and expected that the wording of the biblical text to adapt in order to ad address its meaning in an understandable way to people of that age. Um, just to show you the complexity of Greek, how many ways do you think you can say John loves Mary? Any guess? This is John loves Mary, not Mary loves John, by the way. I, I've showed you about 96 but there are a total of 384 ways to say John loves Mary. And this number goes up to 500 if we include other legitimate word orders and if we were to consider the different verbs for love. Because uh, there are about five ways you can say love in Greek. So technically we can reach up to 1200 different ways to say John loves Mary, okay? I'll give you another example of textual variance, right? You have won $10 million. Thou hast won $10 million. Y'all have won $10 million. Okay. Of the 27 letters and numbers in line two, only seven in line three are the same. So you would say that there is only a 28% similarity between those two. And yet the meaning is exactly the same. Okay. Uh, and again, this, some, some of the language here is more colloquial. And, uh, you know, it, it could be written in many different other ways. I, I just showed you three, right? But the meaning's still the same. Uh, one is more casual, one is more archaic, one is more uh, modern. But analyzing it, there's only 28% similarity. One other thing I forgot to mention. If there, a word is misspelled one time in a manuscript, and you see that all throughout the copies, like let's say through 2,000 copies, that counts as 2,000 variants, right? So it's counted each time, even if it's in the same copy, right? So it's, it's um, if it's found in like the second copy, the second oldest copy, and it's found all throughout the rest, then you could say there's 5,700 variants for that. Okay. I want to show you guys another diagram, which, which shows you like, okay, here you have the original manuscript, right? And then you have the copies. And then you, you may have one copy here that's in red that's, uh, that says only is mystic, right? The, the actual text is the only son of God. And in here, the word only is omitted or missing, right? And then, then you have copies of those. But you can easily cross-check the ones that, that had that alteration, right? Any miscopied or false heretical manuscript would be considered to be the minority in this case and could be easily cross-examined with all other copies, right? And to assume that no genuine copies existed would be a wildly outrageous claim, right? Um, between all the differences, though, the main question is, what is at stake theologically? What is at stake in the doctrine? Is anything affected, right? That's the question, and we'll get to that. Here's an example of that manuscript I showed you that had a footnote. Um, this, so this is the text, and I think this is the Codex Vaticanus. And there's a footnote here on the side, right? And it says, fool and knave. Uh, so he's, he says, fool and knave, leave the old reading and do not change it. Because apparently the scribe decided to take upon himself to, to maybe alter or uh, change something. And then somebody noticed that and, and put a footnote there. So I just thought that was very interesting, wanted to show you guys. Um, but anyway, back to, back to our question here of what's at stake. So there are four different kinds of variations here. You could divide it up into two things, viable and meaningful. What do I mean by those two things? Meaningful me does, means that, does any of these errors change the meaning of the text, right? Does it change the meaning? Is it meaningful? Viable, what does viable mean? Viable means are these errors found in the earliest of manuscripts? Are they authentic errors or variants, I should say, 
that were there from the very beginning. If it's at an if it's in the 16th century manuscript, it's not viable. Okay, that means that means it wasn't authentic. It was something that somebody screwed up in the 16th century. Okay. So the first group of uh, variants you are considered neither viable nor meaningful, right? The majority are spelling differences that have no impact on the meaning of the text, and they did not have a standardized spelling, but often followed regional usage. Sometimes in Greek, you would write John with two N's or one N, right? You could say that about 70% of all the variants are fall into this category, neither viable nor meaningful, okay? Now, if we go to the second one, viable but not meaningful. Uh, an example of this can be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. One medieval manuscript had written the gospel of Christ instead of the gospel of God, right? Uh, the variation is meaningful, right? The gospel of Christ has a meaning. It's not nonsense, but it has no credibility. It's not viable. Why? Because it is a late manuscript. All the ones before it said the gospel of God. Okay? So it's not viable. It's not, it's not like something that was found in the most ancient of manuscripts. Right? Number two, viable but not meaningful. So th that means it was in the ancient manuscripts, but the, the change or the variant had no meaning to it. Uh, like a typo or, or, you know, a word was misspelled, right? So it was ancient, but it doesn't carry a meaning. It's a spelling mistake, okay? And then the last one, both meaningful and viable. What is that? These are the smallest in the category, and they say it consists of about less than 1% of the textual variants, okay? So that's less than 1% of the 400,000 that Bart Ehrman is claiming. How meaningful are these uh, differences? Uh, I gave you an example already with uh, Echomen in Romans 5.1, right? Either we have peace or let us have peace. Which one was it? The difference is a single letter, but it has meaning, right? Uh, it's either a long O or a short O, and it, it could, it's, it's um, found in ancient manuscripts, and some of them are, are, you know, scholars are split on what was the intended meaning, okay? But again, these are less than 1%. So to summarize, how accurate is it? Because, you know, as somebody who, who, who wants numbers, who wants the statistical analysis that tells us what is it? Is it accurate or is it not? What is the percentage of it that's accurate? Okay. I'm going to show you some quotes now from the scholars themselves. The first one being Bart Ehrman, the atheist. Okay. He says, in fact, most of the changes found in the early Christian manuscripts have nothing to do with theology or ideology. That's from his book, Misquoting Jesus. Okay. You have Westcott and Hort estimate that only one sixtieth of the variations were more than trivial, which means the text is 98.33% pure. Ezra Abbott concludes the text is 99.75% pure. Okay. Um, textual critics of almost all theological stripes agree that we can reconstruct somewhere upwards of 97% of the New Testament text beyond a shadow of reasonable doubt. And it is certainly the case that no Christian belief or doctrine depends solely on a textual disputed passage. Okay, these are not all quoted from one another because notice the statistics are different. The New Testament has not only survived in more manuscripts than any other book from antiquity, but it has survived in a purer form than any other great book, a form that is 99.5% pure. The size of the manuscript tradition also makes it possible to determine beyond any reasonable doubt that the original reading would have been an upward of 99% of the New Testament. Okay. Um, most modern textual critics agree on the bulk of the text. Some, 95%, perhaps. Uh, it sounds like this guy isn't, uh, is kind of begrudgingly making that statement. It is the remaining 5% or so where disputes occur and different conclusions may be found. Okay. The resulting text is 99.99% accurate, and the remaining questions do not affect the area of cardinal Christian doctrine. 
This one though, this last quote, I think you guys should pay attention to, right? The DSS, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Those, are, those were found in 1940s and they were, um, well, I explain it here. They have been found to have been included texts from the Old Testament dating from as early as the third century BC. Biblical scholar Gleason Archer compared the accuracy of the modern version of Isaiah to the Dead Sea Scroll version and found more than 95% of the text to be identical. So third century BC and modern day Isaiah, that's a huge, huge gap, right? Third century um, BC, that's, you know, that, that's, if you do the math, that's, that's, that's a lot. You know, the, the text that we have of Isaiah is probably taken from the Masoretic text, which is about 1000 AD. So 1000 AD plus 300, around 1300 years. And he's saying that if you compare that old ancient manuscript, it's 95% the same, okay? And the New Testament books are way, way early, way, um, way after that. They're not in the third century BC, right? And they're the first century AD. So that, that's kind of a staggering statistic that we should uh, keep in mind. Okay, should this trouble us? Should we be bothered by the fact that the, the word of God, oh, it has variance, you know, what's, Something, something's maybe that, that troubles me. I think it's important we have to understand that manuscripts have varied over time, but not concerning the meaning, right? And how that meaning is expressed over time is different, right? This is due to the fact that the texts were written within a certain context in history, and you cannot remove it from that context so in order to allow the message of God's word to speak to the people of today, it's important that the message adapt to modern ears and not remain in archaic language. Like, for example, read King James right now. Um, it, it's to the point where it's almost lost in translation. Uh, and that's why translations must continue to happen over time so that that message could be understood throughout the generations. Okay. So the first thing, translations have various ways to express an idea accurately, okay? So by nature, the human language is flexible. Most words in any language have a range of possible meanings, right? Uh, the Greek word slipsis could be translated as tribulation, trouble, oppression, or affliction. And each of these renderings are valid, right? So there, there are a number of ways you can translate words, okay? Languages evolve over time and have unique geographical characteristics. And I, I put here as an example, British English versus American English, even in the modern day context, you know, how they spell words in Britain and how they pronounce them are different and how they write them could be different, okay? Translations generally follow one of two main methods. And we'll talk about more of this when we go into biblical um, inspiration and interpretation. But there are two ways, the literal and dynamic. Okay, the literal is, the goal of the literal is translating it word for word exactly the same, right? And there's a benefit to that, but there's also a downside to that, right? Um, it, you, you might have a better understanding of what each word means, but sometimes you could get lost in translation. Like if I were to tell you, translate the Saidi joke, it's probably going to, I could translate it for you word for word, but it's not going to make any sense to you, right? The other side of it is dynamic, where it's more interpretive. I'm giving you the gist of the meaning, right? Um, and so I might not be translating it word for word because word for word not make, might not make any sense. So I have to interpret it for you. And there are positives and negatives to that as well, okay? And we'll, we'll talk more about that later in a different section. But I just wanted to give you guys that understanding that when you translate, um, there, there, there are different schools, right? Some people are very strict. Let's keep it literal. Let's keep it exactly the same. And there are some who are more interpretive in how they translate. And each has its pros and cons, okay? Variants in the manuscripts do not affect the fundamental truths in the Bible. 
there are places where you'll notice slight differences in wording um, between the translations. Um, and that's, luckily we have a wealth of manuscript evidence and copies and uh, we can make judgments based on these. But I have to emphasize the fact that these variants absolutely do not change any of the theological teachings of scripture, or, nor of the ethics or their morals, okay? So that's, that's really important, right? All variations in wording can be studied by any person who is willing to do their homework and learn, right? Nothing here is being hidden from you. Anybody can go and do the research as I have done and I looked into it. Everybody can do it, right? You can, you can sign up, take courses. You can, you can do the research and look into it. Uh, it's preferable that you have like a guide and you, you speak with your priest, of course. Uh, and thankfully we have a Buna. But, but the resources are not like hidden. You know, none of this is really hidden from you. You can study it and look into it um, and read many good books about it. Right, so, so it's not like it's hush hush, we can't talk about it. They're trying to hide it from you. The church is trying to hide it from you. No, you can, you can do the study and research it on your own, right? Um, the variations in wording keep us humble, seeking God's understanding and our growing understanding, okay? So God's word is not always easily understood, right? Some of the issues lie behind the variations in wording between our translations and how we study, but this means that we need to lean into the scripture and learn how to approach it and read it through the mind of the church, right? There is something rewarding about, you know, studying it and, and praying as you're doing it, and you finally grasp the meaning of the text, and this is something really rewarding, right? It, when things kind of just click, it makes sense. Um, and the beauty of it is that it's so complex, right? It, it keeps us from being arrogant, thinking that we have all the answers, right? The Bible is, when you're studying it and, and praying it and living it, it has so much to offer us. And each time it's something new. There's always some treasure that, that's there to be found. And obviously this, this is something to remind us to keep us humble, right? Uh, that none of us truly know everything there is to know. It's false to assume that anything unwritten, edited, or added is invalid and does not spring from the living and breathing tradition of the church. One of the biggest fallacies that Bart Ehrman and many other Christian scholars make is that since we don't have the originals to verify the meaning, then any variation between the copies deters them from being uh, valid. Okay, he says... That actually, this is a claim Bart Ehrman makes. Um, he says, if God really wanted us to keep his word, he would have preserved it for us. The problem with this assumption is that it assumes that the inspiration of scripture is limited only to the original copy. It is denying any possibility that the Holy Spirit inspired other scribes or provided them with insight into the biblical text to make it palatable, beneficial for future generations to understand. Why would the Holy Spirit not also inspire these copies? Better yet, why would the Holy Spirit not inspire the church and guide her into the acceptance of such writings, given the huge ramifications of falsehood words to be found? Okay, um, regardless of how you want to answer these questions, it still does not address the auth authenticity and reliability that is found within the scriptures and its claim for the resurrection of Christ, which we will examine probably next week. So in addition to that fallacy, right, Ehrman makes the mistake that we can only trust what is committed to in writing. And that's what a lot of evangelicals also make this error. Scripture is very clear that we not only keep what has been taught through written word, but also through spoken word provided through the holy tradition of the church. Because the faith is not limited to what is committed in writing. This is not sola scriptura. It is a life that must be lived and found within the context of the church. Okay, so despite not having the original manuscripts, God was able to provide the means for which we can accurately reconstruct it with a very high level of confidence based on the many copies, the many early copies we have, the writings of the early fathers, and the living, breathing tradition that was passed down from the apostles and which survives today in the church. Okay, 
And, and our aim here isn't so much that we have the original copies and preserve them, but that we cultivate it and preserve the word of God in our hearts and allowed it to produce its fruit, right? Skeptics like to say, unless we have 100% certainty, we can never know what the original said. But that's a self-refuting claim, because if it were true, we can never know, then we can also not know with certainty that we can say we never know, right? In other words, you're claiming superior knowledge about the facts over scholarly analysis. But how did somebody arrive to this conclusion? Okay. Uh, not only are, are they undermining all the historical eva evaluation and investigation, um, but then at what point would be the purpose of academic historical studies? So we must remind, remind ourselves like the real purpose of the New Testament was to preserve the faith handed down from the apostles, not to create an inerrant relic. It's the message of the gospel that saves. It's not perfect copying. That's the focus, right? Well, someone might ask, aren't we supposed to have the inerrant word of God preserving every letter for all time? But that's not even what the early church or holy fathers um, experience, right? It's, it's to preserve the faith, right? The, the church fathers quoted from the Old Testament, um, the Greek Old Testament Septuagint, and they compared it with the Hebrew text, and they discussed the variations between them. They did not expect the translation to be perfect for it to be an authoritative witness to the faith. And the point of the New Testament, again, as I said, is to preserve the message of Christ and what he did for us, right? And, and for us to accept that into our hearts, right? That, that's the ultimate um, goal, okay? Bottom line is, God doesn't control man but he cooperates with him. He cooperates with him. He doesn't dictate or control him. That, that goes against our whole concept of orthodox uh, theology, right? Our orthodox theology teaches what? Synergy. Synergy, which is what? It's the working of God with man. Man has to cooperate with God. He doesn't control him like a mechanical dictation machine. No, it's a union, it's a, it's a work that, is in, that involves both man and God. And when it involves both man and God, um, that gives us insight into, you know, why we have based on this evidence. We'll talk more about what does that mean, you know, what is scripture and what is inspiration? What does that mean the, that God cooperates or man cooperates with God, right? Of course, man gives his two, five loaves and two fish, and it's not perfect, but God can bless it and make something out of it, right? In the same sense, we have this manuscript tradition and all this evidence, and God has blessed it and preserved it for, the, kept the teaching the same and preserved it throughout all generations. And we can, we can study it. We have the evidence for it. Unlike any other religion, we have ancient um, the most copies, the most early copies, um, and, and we have so much study that's gone into it that it's, it's really beyond any comparable uh, ancient documentation, whether Christian or not. So that concludes the section of, you know, whether or not we can determine what we have now is the same as what was originally written. The next portion is, okay, Assuming that what we have is already is what was written originally, who's to say that what was written originally is even reliable to begin with, right? Um, and I might end here, but just to give you a snapshot on what we're going to talk about maybe next week, the criteria for authenticity. We're going to recap the early dating of the books. We're going to show I'm going to show you the progression of when these books were written. I showed you in lecture one. Uh, but I'll show you again, just so you have an idea of the time frames. We're going to talk about the oral tradition of the church. How, how reliable is this? Some people said 50 years have passed since the time we have a copy or, or since the time it was written to the time the events actually occurred, decades have passed. And myths and legends can happen within a decade. 
So then we need to talk about oral tradition. Is it reliable? And then we're going to talk about two main things, internal evidence and external evidence. The internal evidence consists of what? Number one, if it was written and it's accurate, it would make sense that it would carry on the proper cultural setting. The proper, um, like if I was writing in the two, right, like right now, and my writing would have to be characteristic of my time. So in the same sense, the New Testament would have to have characteristics of that ancient time. It has uh, detailed particulars, mentions landmarks, regions, names. Um, we'll talk about the unprestigious authorship. We'll talk about the sincerity and the tone, the quality of the tone and the writings. We'll talk about morality, the level of morality that's in the text, the eyewitness accounts. Um, we'll examine if there were ulterior motives in writing. We'll talk about whether or not these were coherent testimonies, whether or not they were distinct or they're copied. Uh, Complementing narratives, unlikely content by either hard to understand verses, scandalous material, unimportant, quote unquote, unimportant passages, criteria of dissimilarity. And then we'll look at the external evidence, which are the early writings of the fathers, secular historical accounts, somebody asked about that last week, and the archeological findings and references. This is gonna be the bulk of the series, and this is probably the most exciting portion of it, in my opinion. Um, but probably now we should stop. Uh, and if anybody has any questions. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thanks. Uh, really good presentation, very exciting um, that you're diving into the details and, and the data behind it. Uh, I'm, I'm a data person also. Um, but I was wondering if you could send out either send out a list or something that we could not uh, check your sources or anything, but like see the sources that you're using to provide this information, if that's possible. Sure. Um, uh, were you talking about like something in specific? Primarily the, uh, like, you know, I, I saw you, you quoted different books talking yeah. about the, the accuracy and the percentages. Yeah. So um, let me see if I can uh, go back to that section here, right? This part, right? Yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I have them here. Uh, you know, this guy, Bart Ehrman, this one is a lawyer, actually, and who, who examines uh, the truth of scripture. I don't know if he was an atheist or not. And then some of these are apologetical books, others are not. This guy, the one who's like some 95%, perhaps, he sounds kind of like a, I don't know, doesn't sound like an apologetic book, but um, feel free, by the way, to Google or look into it. Uh, I have yet to find anything from pro-Christian or not that said anything about anything lower than about like 95% accuracy. I struggled. I actually tried to find something um, and I couldn't find anything, right? So, so one, one thing I was curious about, and this is, I think, uh, to touch on a later topic that you said, was the different translations. Like, obviously these numbers can't be true for all of the translations. Like, obviously there are different translation, translations that are more accurate than others yeah we're i think when we so there are, there is a section to this after we talk about the criteria of authenticity i'm going to talk about contradictions we will briefly cover contradictions in the criteria of authenticity portion but because it's such a big topic i think it deserves its own section and as part of the contradictions section i'm going to talk about that uh translations in more detail right now i even have a graph uh showing you know different versions like new king james and esb and all these other ones and i have like a plot showing the literal dynamic plot and where they are on that plot right like some of them are are try to stick to the literal and in some ways that's good you know um but it can have its downsides and we'll, we'll go into those pros and cons of each uh, but I was trying, I was kind of hoping we could save that for 
when we go into like biblical contradictions, quote unquote contradictions. Got it. No, that makes sense. I, I figured you would touch on it, but I just was wondering, uh, well, I, I don't need to say anything else at this point because it's obviously you're going to, you're going to cover that. So just something that stood out to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of some of this stuff kind of overlaps, but um, I can either choose to go heavy now or later, but it, it made sense to go later. And it's not that heavy, to be honest. It's just, it's more of a clarification on what I meant and, and what, are that pro, what are those pros and cons. I just didn't want to digress too much from today's topic, which is, you know, can we accurately reconstruct the, Old Test, the New Testament? You know, that's kind of what the goal was today. Makes sense. Yeah. Feel free if anybody wants, you could screen capture this and, uh, you know, fact check me. Or, or if you find something, that says otherwise, you know, I'm happy to see it. You could, you guys can play devil's advocate too. I mean, try to ask those questions. I just want to add a little, very quick comment here. Well, uh, just want to ask a question, guys. So why is the Bible written and why our old Jesus Christ came to our world? Maybe, Abuna, the answer might be a little bit simple, but for salvation. Yeah, that's right. It's for salvation, of course. For salvation, that's right. That's right. Well, the point is that I'm so glad by this study, by the way, guys. But this study should not be the focus or... It is. It should be. It, it, I don't want to say it's not should be a focus, but I just want to, to let you know that the scope of our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible... It goes very deep and beyond that, okay? So, for example, we understand, we know that our minds are perfect and we do have a wonderful mind. We have, do have wonderful and perfect minds. So we can see right now how advanced technology we are encountering and we do have an advanced technology and this shows how great is our minds. But in spite of that, or despite that, we can still find in the most perfect and most advanced companies technology two people that hate each other and they are genius for example but unfortunately they hate either each other so there is still some things that we can find in the human in the human being which will not be fixed by any type of studies or technology which the only way to be s fixed with is through our lord jesus christ that's why we can find as tony was saying the bible it's it's the message itself it's not it's not the letter as much as it's the message itself so it's it's not that we're looking for a letter as much as we're looking for the message itself for the message of salvation for the message of the new man for for the message of the new life that we're going to that we're going to live for the for the message of the new man that we're going to live according to Christ and so forth this is the very important this is the core of our belief the study is great, but again, let's try to think about the core of our belief, which is the salvation, which is the, the thing that the core thing that our Lord Jesus Christ came around is just for renewing the human nature. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Abuna. Um, George, you, you said something earlier, and I think I, I answered. I didn't. I didn't. I want to clarify something. When they said uh, constructing the actual words, this is in regards to the Greek. This is not in regards to the English, right? So the frame of reference is with the Greek. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. That, that makes sense, okay. Yeah, so, I see. so yeah. Got it. Obviously when you're studying biblical texts, right? You, it's most valuable that you understand the Greek, the original language that it was written in. Now yep. once you start translating it, obviously, its meaning is, you know, you could do your best coming up with the, the, the meaning itself. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but you can get very, very close, right? And again, that's why you have many people translating different ways. And, yep. Nope, uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah. Um, and like as Abuna said, right, the goal isn't like, even if, you know, we, we come to the conclusion, okay, well, okay, it, it's it's logical to believe right we, we can't stop there like i said before um originally in the first talk right there's a difference between believing that god exists and believing in god 
right? Uh, even the demons believe, but unless we, we have trust and we have faith, uh, you know, then it, then it doesn't really go anywhere. That's truly right. So for example, if I do the research and I find that I found 99% of the manuscripts are similar, and this is a great achievement, okay, or 100% are similar, and this is a great achievement, okay, but I still do have a kind of hatred in my heart, or my temper is not, or, or I'm struggling with anger, okay, for example, okay, so that doesn't solve the problem of the achievement that I did doesn't solve my problem, the inner problem of mine. So the inner problem of mine should be solved in a different, totally different way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> um, I guess we'll, we'll wait till next week to, to continue. Um, that's probably, I think, the most exciting portion of it anyway. So... Uh, are there any announcements? Anybody? Yeah, so Sunday, Tony, we are gonna gonna have, I think, Monica will be giving the talk, I think so. Perfect. I don't know, but- Yes, I, you told me. Wrong. Yeah, okay, excellent, okay. And we're going to start the series of the heroes of the Bible, I think so. Excellent. Yeah, 